I think that I want to get into the whiteboard, which is the fun stuff. I am going to get into that, but I want to touch on a couple of things because which, what I believe has a big impact on how I invest. And whether you know it or not, what you believe has a big impact on what you invest. So I'm going to talk about some very basic, what I believe to be truths before we get into the long stuff, because there's a lot of different ways you can write a long. A long can, just because you can write a long doesn't mean you should, right? So we're going to talk about how to understand what you're doing and what impact it has. So what it accomplishes, what you believe and what you, what you actually truly can put your focus on. Hold on one second. Um, so I was just talking about basic truths. Anybody have any arguments against that? You know, a lot of times this is actually um, associated with a bad thing, right? Like, uh, you know, the rich just get richer and the poor get poor. Like, but this is, this is actually taught by Jesus to his disciples, this message. Do you, anybody go to Sunday school? Do you remember uh, the parable of talents? Have you, anybody heard of that before? Where, so basically, um, a guy uh, is a master. He has three servants. He gives each of them a certain number of talents. First one he gives 10, the next one he gives five, the next one he gives one. The talent, they think, may have been about 80 pounds of silver, which would be about 20 years wages. If you were to say that we had, you know, somebody with a year's wage of making $50,000 a year, it'd be kind of like having a million dollars in our society. So 10, five, and one, he goes away for a long time. Doesn't say how much comes back and he goes to the first guy and says, Hey, I gave you 10 talents. What'd you do? With him? And he goes, well, I made 20. Awesome. Well done. Since you were responsible with a little bit, I'm going to give you a lot. What'd you do with the 5 million I gave you to the next guy? I turned it into 10. Awesome. Since you were faithful with little, I'll give you a lot. Then he gets to the guy he gave one to and he goes, Hey, where's my talent? And the guy's like, well, see what had happened was, you know, <laughs> I heard about, you know, how you are with your money. And like, uh, basically I got scared and went and hit it in a field. You want me to go get it? And the reaction was probably what anybody's would be would be like, are you kidding me? I gave you a million dollars and you just went and buried it in a hole. You could at least put it in a bank so I can get interest. So at, after all that's said and done, he says, to those who have more will be given and to those who don't have more will be taken away. This is not a bad statement. It's just a true statement. I'm bringing that up because I feel like what I believe about that story has an impact on how I invest. And the, me the main message I get out of that is that it's not enough to just have talent. It's really conv it's convenient that it's named talent because this is talking about money, but it's talking about so much more than money. You're not just responsible for having it. You're responsible for multiplying it. And if you believe that, you will invest differently than if you are afraid that you're not capable of doubling what you have. And you'll go hide it in a hole because you're afraid of losing it. I believe that's true. So, um, why did he hide it in a hole? A little bit of participation from somebody. Maybe the economy was unstable. Maybe the economy was unstable. That, you know, that could be a part of it. He said he was scared. Right? And fear comes from uncertainty. And uncertainty comes from not being ignorant to what's about to happen. I got a funny story. Um about how this actually played out in my investing. I, um, I was driving to work back when I used to work in the fire department and I was listening to an episode of Marketplace on NPR and they were talking about this new technological like packets of data that could be like verified and, and put together. And I'm like, you know, I'm listening to this and it sounds like 
you know, really interesting to me. I, I didn't fully understand it, but it's talking about how it could be used as currency. And they said the reason it was on TV, the reason it was on there was because it was called Bitcoin and it had just crossed the one dollar threshold. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, man, based on where they're talking about this as a currency that's useful, this sounds like it's, sounds like it could be something, you know, sounds like something a government would be interested in. And I was getting a $2,000 bonus check from work. I remember thinking, man, I wonder if I just took that bonus check and put it in here, what would happen? And I drove to work and forgot about it and never did any fans. It's not beat. Bitcoin is worth a little less than 20, and well, it's actually around $28,000 right now. And um, that's fine. There's going to, you're going to run across that, you know. Um, I'm happy I had the thought, to be honest with you. Uh, I really don't think about it much. A buddy of mine called me asking if he should pay off his mortgage with his Bitcoin that he spent 20 bucks on or whatever it was. That kind of hurt a little bit, but. Um, all right. This is how most people use, this is how people are losing money right now with fear. You're not in the market. They decided to get in the market because things were good. This is the last year of the Dow, by the way. And let's say that they got in at $32,000 because a buddy of them told them they need to stop sitting on the sidelines. So they get in, they start feeling good because it's going up, starts going down, they get past, they start losing money. They go up, I'm out. So they're out here. Then as it goes up and goes up and goes up, it looks like it's going back up to where their top was at and they get scared of losing. So they jump back in and while they're feeling good, feeling good, they stay in. It goes out, goes out, goes out, then they are. They just lost more money. And eventually they get to a point where they just stop playing the game. A lot of people do that. Why do you think they're doing that? It's fear. Where's the fear coming from? Losing money. Well, yeah, they're afraid of losing money, but why, why are they losing money and so many other people are making money? They don't know enough about the market. They're not educated enough because the people who know enough about the market see this. Up oh, and to the right. For how many years is that from the 70s? What is that? 50 something years now? 55 years? A little bit of knowledge can make it where fear no longer determines what it is you're about to do. Go up and to the right. Why is it doing this? I'm actually it's stable. Well, yeah. It's a finite resource too, isn't it? Okay. Well, I mean, that's more specific to gold. I meant, why are all of these doing this? Up and to the right. Time. time is a part of it. Well, some people might think that uh, the, the technology might be to blame, right? If, if you're looking at the Dow and stocks are a measure of our productivity, certainly technology has made us more productive. And I would say that there's some truth to that. But that doesn't explain all of them. I think I might have heard somebody whisper it. Inflation. Inflation. Who said Inflation. Inflation. Inflation is, ex understanding inflation is extremely important to keeping your eye on the ball. Because if you don't understand inflation, you don't understand how most of the game is played. Like, who, does anybody have any idea what the current measured rate of inflation is? The most recent was like, Six and some change. So if you have $100,000 sitting in a safe, and let's say it was this all year, how much do you have at the end of the year? 6% Six less. 6% Six less. You had the buying power of $94,000. Do does, does anybody, you don't have to answer this, but does anybody in here have money that's sitting on the sideline? It was up to 11%. Actually, I think I have, I think I have, yeah, consumer price index. This is the government's, one of their measures of inflation. It's, some would argue, is 
uh, uh, push down and suppress, they have reason to do that because if the world feels like our inflation rate is higher, they want to get away from the dollar. But that right there is, did you look at where it got to? It got to 9%. If you had money sitting, sitting in a bank account, hearing in a half a percent, did you know you lost 10% of it? So why is that happening? What's inflation? Mainly it's the increase in money supply. Increase in money supply, a monetary base. What does that look similar to? Just about every other graph we saw earlier. What happened? What happened? In, do you might remember what happened back in the seventies when Nixon was president? That may have where we're capable of doing this. Took us off the gold standard. Took us off the gold standard. So he took, took us off the gold standard, and we were already the reserve currency of the world, and we've been melting that cow, and we will continue to melt that cow for as long as it produces milk. We are one of the only places where we can shell out paper and get products and inflate the debt away. What do I mean by inflate the debt away? If I have a mortgage on a house that's $70,000 in 1950, and I have a $65,000 loan on that house, that's a big loan. It's, you know, 90 something percent. 10 years from now, that's a smaller loan relative to the value of that property. 20 years from now, it's half, maybe less than that, without even ever paying it out. So inflation is extremely, extremely important. I would say probably one of the most, most important things when, when doing any type of investing, but especially real estate investing, because the inflation rate affects, it affects what the interest rates are on loans and loans determine how you leverage property. And out of all of the different assets that we saw there, real estate is one of the only ones that allow you to, in some instances, leverage at a hundred percent. So that means that I could go out and get a million dollar property and put 5% down and rent it out at some point and somebody else pays that mortgage for me and I still own that million dollar asset. You can't do that with gold. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to kind of I thought this meme was really funny it, just because it has to do with the current system. I'm not sure if any of you guys have been paying any attention to what's going on with the bank, small bank failures, SVB, stuff like that. This is a, a meme is so great because it can kind of really make a very strong statement and just like, like that, right? Because the Fed will always push this button. If they have a choice between this banking system collapse and this, they will always push this button. Correct the money. And knowing that means that getting a hold of assets are extremely important because inflation, let me back up a little bit on here, see if it'll allow me to. Inflation, the ultimate tax on wages. So if you are a wage earning employee and you're in an inflationary environment, you are losing pay every single check. But if you have asset and you're in an inflationary environment, you're gaining income every single month that there's inflation. And knowing that they're going to hit this button, which they are, they're smashing on this button right now. It's not, it's in the news, but nobody understands it. SVB owned $80 billion in mortgage-backed security. It had a 2%. I feel like I might be getting a little off the rails here. I could talk about that for a long time. Let me go back. If you guys want to want me to go into that. I will. Real estate. I like this one here, betting against the champ. Out of the last, since 1941, real estate has been 73, 7, and 1 in appreciation. So if you're betting against real estate, you're betting against the champ. And it's so often that people will go, oh, there's going to be a crash. There's going to be a crash. There's always, there's going to be a crash. And sometimes there is a crash, right? But why do you think there's going to be a crash? Um, take a look at this. 
Now, out of all the up and to the right graphs we looked at, if you got queasy to your stomach and you had to ride a roller coaster, which one would you rather be on? Real estate is easy to get steady without having the ups and emotional downs of ups and downs. You may not win as big. You definitely can win bigger in a more volatile market. You can lose bigger too. A lot easier. And that's real estate. Case Schiller, it's not, again, it's one of those things where they're including a lot of those, I um, mean, 70% of it is cities that are very high priced. So it's not a very accurate indication. I don't want to go too deep into that here. Um, demographics determine destiny. Has anybody ever heard that core? All right, let me explain that. This is the U.S. population age breakdown. This area, here, let me go here. Over here, this is the baby boomers. This is the population that people went, oh my gosh, there's so many people. And look what it did after that. The millennials are bigger than the baby boomers. And they're 25 to 29. What are they going to be looking for with having kids? They don't want to stay in an apartment no more. They want to buy a house. We're starting to see a little bit of a drop off here, which could be a, you never want this to be turned upside down. That's what China and Russia and that, we're, we're sitting in a pretty good spot as far as this goes, but you have to take advantage of it because this is inflationary. Do you, do you guys understand what I mean when I say this is inflationary? This year, these 25 year olds who are just learning and learning new technology and trying to make their way and carve their way into the workforce, the Fed is slamming on the brakes right now in the economy and they can't because all of these people are being productive and they're produced it. Not to mention, I just want to go back a little bit to another one. Not to mention, you got all of that going on, but the monetary base, this just happened two years ago. Trillions of dollars injected into the economy because, because of a virus. Whatever you think of it, it happened. That is not done working its way through. There's something that they call the velocity of money, how many times a dollar is spent. So I bought those bagels, that person goes out and buys some gas, and that person who owns the gas station goes out and buys the house. That's happening with this. Inflation is, we have not seen what inflation is, will do. The Fed thinks they have control over it, which slamming on the brakes by raising interest rates does have put some control on it. But let me show you kind of what it does. So let's say that you have, let's say this is the, you know, 20 million people who's going to be buying a house in the next couple of years, right? Well, if there's only, no, I'll say 563,000 homes available right now over the year, if you were to do that over a monthly period, what are you talking about? Uh, somewhere about 7 million, 6 or 7 million. Um, and all of these people here are looking for, for a home, the way that you basically control this volume so that it doesn't get soaked up is by making it unaffordable for this many people. The demand has not gone anywhere. It's there and it's pent up. But right now, because of interest rates of 7% and wages have been thought up, this is, this is feeling a little bit more thick. You still have 30 days on market. Real estate. Um, inventory today, 578,000 homes. Active listings. This right now is where the inventory is at. This is where the inventory was at 2017, 18, and 19. Was that a bad market? We have very low inventory. We're not as low as it was in 2022, but we have a very low inventory. And anybody knows who knows anything about economics, this is how it works. Price, quantity, Supply, demand. When the supply is low, the price is high. When supply is high, price is low. This is equilibrium. 
on the low. And what they're doing is they're, tr they're trying to, they're trying to hold back the demand. They're stuck because of this problem right here. Because as they raise interest rates, all those 2% mortgages that got written over the last couple of years, they're not worth anything. And banks have trillions of dollars of that right now. And the higher they raise the rate, the less those assets are and the more in trouble the banks are. Now, Silicon Valley Bank was special. They had a huge portion of their books were in this and they, there's, they may have been kind of taking advantage of some loopholes, which, um, you know, they weren't regulated the same way big banks are. So, you know, Chase may not have the same problem right now. Can you just expand one little bit on that statement that because they have 2% loans and now they're at seven, it yeah. makes the bank in trouble? Yeah. Okay. So let's say that you had a hundred thousand right. dollars right now. And I said, I can write you a note that says, Hey, look, if you give me a hundred thousand dollars, I'll give you back 10%. Right. Or I can write you a note that says, I'll give you back 5%. Right. Which one would you take? 10. Okay. What if, what if I gave you 20 grand? <laughs> well, and it changes things a little bit, right? Yeah. That's how it works. Okay. So Silicon Valley bank. I, did, I, I said I wasn't going to get into this, but this could air. This, this isn't really about writing loans, but it's about the state of the current situation. Silicon Valley Bank has $80 billion of 2% loan. They run into liquidity problems because people start noticing this and people start pulling their money out of the bank. So now they have to sell some of this $80 billion so if they have to sell 100,000 to pay somebody out and they have to, and that 100,000 is paying 2% and they have to sell this bond to another bank. Another bank's like, I'm not paying you hundred thousand dollars for that. I can go buy a hundred thousand dollar loan for 7% right now. Easy. Oh, okay. It's on the flip side. The bank side is on the flip side. The flip right. Side. Gotcha. So the bank, they'll say, I'll tell you what, I know you need money. I'll give you 75 grand for this. They did that 20 billion times and lost $5 billion like that. That's why it went into bankruptcy. But the Fed saved them. They didn't save them from bankruptcy. They saved the depositor. And when you save the depositors, that's inflationary because the bank writes these loans based on the amount of deposits that they have. So when the depositors pull out all their money, their loans are supposed to contract, but they did. That money's still out there. And all of the money that was in the bank is also still out there because the Fed paid it to them. And where did the Fed get that money? It does not exactly like that, but it's pretty much. So. So when, so, so when the overall, the whole reason I brought this up before I got into the, the long stuff, because, because I really want you guys to get excited about leveraging real estate is because if you have any fear, which you should, always should have a little bit of fear about when you don't know what's going to happen. But if you have any fear about there being a real estate market crash, anything's possible, right? But when somebody tells me the real estate's going to crash and I'm looking at the inventory and see that it's at historic lows. I'm looking at the population that's coming up and we're at historic highs of people that are buying homes. I'm looking at the fact that pretty much, well, let me, let me give you a couple of statistics. 40% of all real estate had no mortgage on it. 60% of the ones that have mortgages on it has a rate with a two or a three of five. Those people aren't going anywhere. So even the, the replenishment of the resale market has been frozen by COVID. We have a major supply problem that is unrealized. A lot of people do realize it. Some, some of the lowest figures you'll see is 3 million short homes. And you know how to get to that number? 
because if you were to take the normal replacement value, the normal replacement needs of obsolete homes, builders normally build about 300,000 homes per year. But what happened after 2008 is all of these people had really bad loans and the housing market got flooded with inventory because they all got foreclosed and everybody turned into renters. So for 10 years, no builder built anything. Why would you build when there's 3 million homes out there and you can get them for less than you can build them? She didn't say anything, but like, you know, like three. Yeah, I'm joking, but. So that's 3 million homes short that we would normally have in our supply. They're not even counting the demographic shift with that. Now the demographics may work itself out and when we were looking at that chart earlier, you know, there were some two and four year olds where it started to go down. So, you know, we, we might balance itself out a couple of years, but they cannot build homes fast enough. We would have to have a major shift in technology in order to build enough homes to make this work. What time is it? I want to make sure I'm not going way over. Okay. Um, so yes, technology can sometimes cause problems when you're banking on something, right? But housing, you got a lot of problems to solve. You get this packet of commodities. It's concrete, it's copper, it's lumber. It's all of these different things that you're still going to have a limited supply of land. Technology can help that too. Driverless cars will open up land a little bit. But the, whole, the, the amount of demand pressure that's on there, some of it can get relieved by technology and you still have a huge amount of demand pressure and a lot of inflation on real estate. All right, let me step out of the data for a little bit. And I want to talk to you guys. Are we all set on the idea that like real estate is possibly going to be something that appreciates in the, you know, next 10 years at least? Can, all right. Out of fun stuff. I have a customer right now. I might jump around a little bit on this, but. I have a customer right now, and uh, I'm gonna call it Higgy. Or ignorant, not because he's dumb. He's a very smart man, but he's ignorant about real estate. And he still wins at real estate, even though he has no idea what he's doing, just because he owns it. Him and his wife has a good job. They have a home up in New York. It's worth a million dollars. They own it for eight bear, no worse. He has another place here that he bought back in 2005. And if you guys remember our chart back in 2005, that was right before the Great Recession. So most people who bought homes during that time, since they most, a lot of them did not stay with that house. The fear caught hold, rightfully so. Bank even had it. Not 80. He had a duplex. And that's, this is one of the things I love about duplexes is that even in a bad market, they can still cash flow. So he has a duplex. He bought it for five hundred and ten thousand dollars, and um, that was back in two thousand five. And and he now he wants to buy a house over here in Sarasota for one point two million, and they can do that. But his plans were not good for how he was going to do that, because he calls me up and he goes, "Yeah, I got this house up here." And uh, it's worth about seven fifty. How much you pay for it? If you all pay five ten back in two thousand five, and uh, you know it's making me like forty eight hundred bucks a month right now. Um, you know, I mean, after taking out the taxes and insurance and all of that stuff, you know, that stuff comes out to be about thirty six hundred bucks a month. I'm making twelve hundred bucks a month on this thing. All right, cool. I think I want to sell that and use that as a sell payment on this. No, you're not. And it said, Iggy, how long have you owned this thing? Since 2005? 18 years? And he's about to use it as if what he was going to make a primary resident for a second home, something he can't temporarily want to change into this tax bill is going to be ridiculous. The way it breaks up is that for, five, this is this little side note, um, he bought it for 510. So the first way he's going to be taxed is on the depreciate. I'm not a tax professional. I'm just kind of keep this in mind. I have to this is, but I, I, I feel like I understand how this works. You break that up into 27 and a half years and you can take that to depreciation. 
and I, I didn't do the calculation ahead of time, so, and I'm not good enough to do 510 divided by 27.5. So 510 times, oop, divided by 27.5, 18,500 basically. Did somebody give me that number with enough? Oh, okay. That's pretty, pretty close. Times 18 years? No, that's not right. 510 divided by 27.5, 18,545. That's how his depreciation is at. Times 18 years. It ends up being about a $50,000 tax bill that he's going to end up with. But on top of that five hundred ten thousand dollars, it appreciated to seven fifty. So the difference between that, he has to pay fifteen percent. So that makes no sense. He also has a three hundred thousand dollar E Trade account. He said, "All right, well, I'll just use that." How long have you had that? I don't know. I've been putting money into it for a while now. You know you have to pay taxes on that too. Well, Adam, what do I do? Well, what you don't have to pay taxes on is loans. You can pull a twenty percent, two hundred forty thousand dollars from this house here to join free and clear. Put it on that one. So now you got a two hundred forty thousand dollar down payment that came to came from there, nine hundred sixty thousand dollar loan, and you just bought that with one hundred percent financing. He wants to sell this one anyway. So he was going to pay interest. I think it's like 9.125 was what is he lost his lease to doing that. You paid 9% over the year or do you pay 70,000 plus or whatever that the no brainer. So what I like about this scenario though, is that it touches on quite a few things. I actually missed some stuff that I've walked that I need to some basic principles that I need to go over with you. What time is it right now? And I want to go to measuring your investment quick. So if your investment has something called the rent to value ratio. It also has something called the debt service coverage ratio it has a bunch of other ratios, but those are the two that I like to focus on because the rent to value ratio is talking to you about how hard your money is working. The debt service coverage ratio is talking to you about your cash flow and your risk. You can, you can own, he can own this home right here and have a $240,000 loan on it. And his money, he gets, he could be getting $4,000 a month at rent. Now, if this loan here is 1600 bucks a month, his cash flow is pretty good. His debt service coverage right here was actually pretty good in this situation. Uh, what does that come out to be? 24, am I doing that right? 2400 bucks? Yeah. 2400 hours a month in cash flow. So his risk is really low. But his rent to value ratio, how his money is working, is trash. He's holding up a million dollars in real estate to make $4,000 a month. Let me show you what he could do. Let's get rid of the housing buying. Let's say he decides that, you know what, I'm going to, I want to rent a condo in Sarasota, kind of get a lay of the land and then sell my house up north. I paid $500,000 for it. It's gained $500,000 in value, but well, since he lived in it, he didn't have to, have to pay taxes on that $500,000 in gain because he's joined with his wife on it. So this year is a real life example. Customer Jessica bought this place, $205,000 place. She listed it for rent for $18.50 a month. After, I won't go through all the little numbers here, but after all of a sudden done, she's making about 400 bucks a month on a $200,000 home cash flow. So she financed that with 25% down. How many of those can this guy buy after selling that house? Well, we put 25% down. That's $50,000. How many times have you put 50 in an air? 20 times. So $50,000 house, well, $50,000 down on a $200,000 house making oops, $400 a month times 20. I think that's 8,000. Is that right? 8,000. $8,000 a month for the same million dollars. 
that's just on paper. There's eight. There's there's twenty roofs here. Keep that in mind. All right, it's not it's not a perfect, you know, transition. But this money is being put to work way harder than this money here. Let's take a look at something else. Let's say that the and let's say the appreciation on this is seven percent. So that means that he you know makes seventy thousand dollars at the end of the year. And I'm giving that a little bit of generous because typically million dollar properties are more volatile. We call it a cyclical market. It could be lower, but it also could be higher. This is gonna, in the long run, this is gonna appreciate more than this $200,000 house here, historically speaking, right? So I'll just make this one here 5% appreciate it. So I have, if I have 5% appreciation on $200,000 times 20, what is that, 4 million? Is that 4 million? Yeah, 4 million. 4 million? At 5%? Which one would you rather have? This is talking about the rent to value ratio. This is why it's important to understand the rent to value ratio. Because when you understand the rent to value ratio, you understand how hard your money is working when you're going into an investment. Most of the time when people are investing in real estate, they win, but they don't really know why they're winning one way or another. I mean, they have an idea, but it's not, you know, they don't like have that really pay. What else did he do here? You know what, uh, Noah, I know you have a, Noah has a property that's a single family home, but I'm actually going to take a look at this duplex here with you guys, because he has a duplex on here. And this duplex here is, I think he's thinking about 500 would be the cost of the duplex to construction. Yeah. I mean, to, or to sell, to sell, to sell it. 500, yeah, 500. So if you were buying this, it'd be around $500, uh, $500,000. Each side here will rent between 23 and 2,500 bucks a month. Even if we went with a lower amount of 2,300 bucks a month, this thing right here, cash flow is almost $1,000 a month. So let's say that he were to, instead of buying a bunch of the $200,000 properties, what if he put 20% down, 25% down, I'm sorry, on a duplex, he put 25% down on those. He could probably buy about eight, I think it is. 500,000. Sorry, guys, times 0. 0.75. It's $375,000, 125,000. 1 million divided by 125,000. Yeah, about eight of those. So you can have 4,600 bucks a month. Oh, let me write the house first. So you have a $500,000 home. You have a loan amount on it for $375,000, uh, $4,600 a month. The monthly payment on this thing here, what well, I have the you no know, cash flow worked out. It's going to be at about $950 a month that you end up collecting times eight of those. And then in $7,600. bucks. And probably less maintenance because you have less roofs. Yeah, less roofs. But. The $500,000 duplex, when the market changes, is a more buffer. If you were to run into a situation where things, for some reason, were to go down, that duplex is going to perform better than that single family home. Single family home is going to perform better in the, in the up market because that's going to appreciate better with things going up. And we've already kind of determined that we think that things based on the numbers are going up. And um, in your packet, the single family home that you have there, no one is there with numbers too. Um, that $200,000 one though is probably one of the safest home run investments. I listened to a guy named Jason Hartman. He talks about that cash flowing Midwest home with, let me show you something. I missed something else here that I wanted to show you real quick. What, what, how much time do I have? 950. All right, I got a few minutes. Let me just go through this real quick because this is the rules of the game that I wanted to hit. I kind of jumped around a little bit. So you have the type of markets that you have when we're talking about the rules of the game are cyclical and linear. So cyclical markets, think about like California, San Diego, you know, those type of places where it's a high flying market. Right? You, can, you can, Kauai, you know, homes may be $15 million and then 10 years later, $50 million, right? So the cyclical market is there's a there's a lot put into the land value on a cyclical market. 
the land has has sometimes way more value than the structure itself. So it's high in its risk and volatility. You can definitely win big. On a down market, you can lose big. It typically is not very good in what's called utility or rent to value ratio. It's not very it's not very useful compared to a home where you're basically getting the land free. That house right there is 90% utility. You're basically buying the packaged commodity of a place to live and you're getting the land pretty much for free. Up until recently, you were getting the land and a portion of the house for free too because you couldn't build that house. And you probably still can't build that house for $200,000. That is a good, safe, strong investment. It's hard to go wrong with that, especially with entry-level housing. We're talking, just looked at 20 million people coming into here. There's going to be more of them looking for that than looking for a million dollar place. Does anybody, um, I, I mean, like I didn't, I don't have like a close or anything like that. I wanted to get to a point where I was talking about this. Um, does anybody have any long questions? Because I, I have a lot of different things that can go in here. Let me, let me show you what we have. Let me get rid of my phone off of here. And then you guys can tell me in the last few minutes, if you want to touch on any of these things. Um, we have the rank financing type. So the type of financing is going to be best for you based on interest rates and things like that. Um, we talked about measuring your investment. Let's go on to rank financing, because I think that one there is going to be um, kind of what you guys came here for. Oops, sorry, I'm not really, I mean, I'm not in the, the uh, thing anymore. So, best to worst, your primary home, you're going to need the best financing on. It's subsidized. It lowers, and you're actually getting negative interest rates, and you consider what the value of the property is, what the actual short-term interest rates are. When you buy a home and you get a you know, 6% rate in a 7% environment, you're, you're getting paid to have that loan. Um, government does that on purpose. Second loan through agency financing. It's almost as bad as investment property. There's ways to make it not as bad as investment property, but two and three are pretty much right next to each other. You can put a little bit less down with a second home. Um, investment property through agencies, meaning like Fannie and Freddie stuff, getting your standard loan, that's gonna be your next level. Um, then you have private stuff like your DSCR loans, your commercial loans. That's the real interest rate. The, the rate that you get from a private lender where you have a conglomerate of people that's deciding that I'm willing to collect 9% on this money, that's the true interest rate. Everything else that we just went over there is subsidized because the government fives those bonds. Then you have the flip financing and hard money. Um, flip financing and hard money, to me, my personal belief is that unless you're doing something that's more than seven hundred dollars or $800,000, you're wasting your time. They're gonna they're gonna take at least fifteen percent in interest. It's designed that way. You can't really get around it on your best deal. And if you're trying to do that on a two hundred thousand dollar deal, you're not gonna win. Um. Yes. Second home versus investment. So if I have a client who's looking at getting a condo, is it better for them to utilize it as a second home or investment? what would be the rate difference on something like that? And so how do you, how do you um, define them when you're applying for the market? What the person is actually using it for is why we defined it. Um, so the, the advantage to going with a second home has pretty much been taken away. The biggest advantage was the fact that you could put 10% down, but they've made it so costly now for you to do that. It's not worth it. Okay. Um, there is a workaround with that. I won't go too far into that because we'll be talking for a few minutes more and more time. And then I did hear that they're starting to tighten the um, criteria for loans. Like all, the interest rates are going up, but also they're a little bit tighter with either. Is that true? A little bit tighter with the market? In the secondary mortgage market, no. In the secondary mortgage market, um, that can, their appetite for that is going to wane with how the market is in a way that I don't even understand. Okay. It's above my pay grade. Um, so uh, the guidelines are the guidelines. So if, 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 I can, if I can look at a guideline and say they meet it, my bank is usually right. If, they, if they're not right, then somebody's explaining to me why we're not right. Okay. So, um, you know what, Noah, um, I would like you to talk a little bit about your new construction financing because I do think North Fort area is what we would consider like to be like a hybrid market. So it's not linear like it would be in the Midwest where you've got no land value, but it's also not high flying like he would be on the key. He has some really good new construction options and new construction is really good because you can self-manage without a whole lot of problems with maintenance. And you also can, um, well, no, go ahead. 
All right, so like Adam alluded to, we are primarily focused on kind of new construction here in the North Ford area. I am a residential real estate broker and also partnered in a development company. So we're focusing on a lot on new construction just because I've been focusing on North Ford a lot more just because of the aspect of there's land availability. There's just a bunch of things coming into North Ford making it make a lot more sense than, for example, building in Sarasota. So who exactly are we? So I'll do this in about five to five, seven minutes or so, but so I'm a management partner here at Jane Development Group. My GC partner, Josh Willow, he's a general contractor. He's a custom home builder. He does luxury degree models with over 18 years of experience. And then like I alluded to, I am a broker associate managing partner, and I also have the most popular YouTube channel here in the North Port area. So I've been use it, using, utilizing that to attract both foreign and um, domestic investors, as well as home buyers here in the North Port area. So I've gotten to learn the North Port market in and out. Um, and I really specialize in new construction, custom home builds, luxury real estate, and also Airbnb investing. So why did, like I said, why are people like kind of moving to North Ford towards North Ford versus Sarasota? So what I like about North Ford is the growth opportunity in that in that respect of both the commercial growth opportunity and then also the residential opportunity. Just because, you know, there's a lot of lots available, you know, there's thousands of lots available in North Ford to look on the MLS, but then on the flip side, they're also only 20 to $25,000 if you get them off market, they're less than that, but you did 20, 25,000 while in Sarasota, obviously lots are a lot more expensive into the hundred thousand dollars for just, you know, less than a quarter of your lot. So I really like that aspect just because you could really scale uh, an investing strategy in North Ford versus Sarasota because it's harder to find lots and land and stuff like that. Another benefit with North Ford is that when I say no HOAs, I mean few HOAs, but in respect to Sarasota, Sarasota is just to mind, in my opinion, just one big HOA. So in North Ford, yes, there are a few HOAs here and there. However, at the end of the day, it's very limited. Um, so what I like about that, the owners give their land freedom. Um, basically, they get a quarter acre size lot versus a, you know, 21, seven acre lot here in Sarasota. So that'll save them about $100, $500 a month on HOA fees and everything like that. So it gives them a little bit more fun silly what they can do with their land. And then also the third thing is affordable house prices here in Northport. You know, the average house price right now, as of this morning, is like $399,000. While in Sarasota, it's a little over $500,000 right now. So it makes it a lot more affordable. Like when I was talking about the inflation, you know, this looming recession, quote unquote, whatever your thoughts are on that. But at the end of the day, people are going to be looking for more affordable housing versus buying in Sarasota for over $500,000. Because if you are a real estate agent, you now that finding a house for $500,000. Newer construction is extremely hard in um, Sarasota and pretty much it's not impossible, but very hard to do. So here in Sarasota or in Northport, you have a lot more flexibility with, you know, you know, lower cost to build the house and everything like that. So those are kind of the three major reasons why I really am leaning more towards an overport but then Sarasota or basically anything else. And before I skip to this slide, move on, I guess. So I like Northport just because as well for the, you know, it is there's so accounting one of the top counties here in Florida. But at the end of the day, Northport is one of the least developed cities in Sarasota County. And as it's such a very hot market here in Sarasota County, it just makes it a lot more sense with those three things combined. So once again, here is just a quick analysis of the average growth here in the North Port area. As you guys can see, it's been going up, you know, change per year population about, you know, four to 9,000 people every single year. So North Port is really on an uptrend. It's not very much on a downtrend, you know, and North Port just has a lot more opportunity for that. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to be just a single family house. So this is just one model that I'll throw about several different models that we have, but this is what our foreign investors and our domestic investors are really looking into just because we can build it at an affordable rate, they can sell it or they can hold it as a tangible asset to then rent out. So for this analysis, we're going to be looking at 1600 square foot out, three bed, two bath with a two car garage. So when we break down it, there's a purchase price here. So we're going to be looking at getting this finance so that you could leave, you know, use your money to your advantage. Is that inch instead of paying all cash for it? So with the purchase price of this house of two hundred eighty nine thousand uh, dollars, your land will just for the grant, but will be free and clear because a lot of our investors do have the land already pretty clear. So that would put the down payment for this house at a little under thirty nine thousand dollars, and then with interest only payments for twelve months. So I'm going to be referencing this as a 12 month investment span just because, you know, with all in construction, everything like that, we'll just say 12 months for easy math. 
So with the interest only payments at under $1,500 per month, their closing costs will be at a higher rate of 4%, but we'll just say that for $9,400 for closing costs on that house. So your cash to close basically on that loan is a little over $48,000. And then with your 12 month investment, so interest only while it can swile the house is being built, they'll put it over to a little over $65,000. And then the expected sale price based on the comps, everything like that in Northport. Once again, this house is going to be more entry level. It's not going to have custom house features like a lot of these other houses do. But once again, we're going for more of the affordable housing ground, quote unquote. Um, so that expected sales sales price would be about $390,000, putting in about $240,000 a square foot. And I know some of these houses that are in this same kind of with the same features, everything like that are selling anywhere between $240 to $250 a square foot, somewhere around there. So we'll just put in, let's say if you want to sell this house instead of renting it, your closing costs, and you did fees, everything like that, we'll throw that in for about $20,000. But if you sell it on your own, you're perfectly fine. Obviously, you could subtract probably about $13,000 from that total. Um, so your potential profit, you're looking at a little over $44,000. So if we're talking return on your investment based on that $65,000 that you put in, you're looking at a little bit over 67% return on your investment. But at the end of the day, a lot of these numbers can fluctuate, such as you would have the added land price to do the loan, or you can subtract agent fees if you're going to sell it on your own, whatever that may be. There's a lot of different factors and variables is to this calculation. But at the end of the day, this is one of the more simpler ways to go about it but once again this is a 1600 square foot floor plan and we have several of them like he was talking about is that we have a duplex option but once again in Northport, multifamily zoning is very hard to come by in Northport, so you'd have to more go down towards the south gulf cove area and so forth for that to really make sense um and i know it's town three so we should be good i tried going through that fast dude, 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 dude. Guys, I I met Noah a couple years ago when he was just getting started, and when I tell you, this dude's got rockets on his feet. He is probably one of the most. He's probably one of the smartest dudes that hell. Honestly, um, thank you, Noah. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, true how tech and plug. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I the Easter gifts I gave you, you know, are uh, basically invitations to my church. If you guys, um, you know, feel welcome to do so, call me. I will, you can sit by me when you get there. Uh, if you, you know, have a different church and maybe you haven't been in a while, it's Easter Sunday. Take a trip. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you.